Thank you. Yes, very happy. Hello, Margaret. Hello, everyone. Bonjour and bienvenue, mes amis. Good morning to all my lovely friends and garden lovers, and welcome to another garden tour this morning. Je suis très excitée. Today, we are going to France, where you can see it's perfectly lovely here in Normandy. We are going to explore two gardens that are truly inspirational. And this word, inspirational, is the theme that binds these two disparate gardens together. Both gardens, so very different to each other, but in their own way, have been inspirational to so many others. One of the most important things to me about great gardens is how they can influence so much else that is beautiful. Gardens themselves can inspire others to create, paint, write, compose, copy, and experiment. I shall, of course, explain. First, we are gonna to go to my most favorite garden in France, Giverny, the Normandy garden of the famous impressionist painter, Claude Monet, whose paintings have inspired generations of artists. I visited Giverny in May of 2012, and I went with an English girlfriend who loves gardens as much as I do, and who very fortuitously spoke excellent French. We drove from England, went through the channel, and found ourselves staying in a lovely B&B &B <clears throat> not far from Giverny. It was a most glorious sunny and hot day in May. The house and gardens are open from the 1st of April. And while the house is charming, it is the gardens that are the draw. Claude Monet was a passionate gardener, as we shall see. And it was his garden, his beautiful garden, that inspired much of his work. So, voila, commençons. Claude Monet's garden at Giverny is probably the most famous garden in France. It is and was a garden of its time. There is no sense of formality or symmetry here, and it is very different to the second garden that we will see at Villandry. The plantings are riotous, colorful, and unrestrained, a great deal like Monet's art. Well, after all, there is a huge connection. Monet was born in November of 1840 in the ninth arrondissement of Paris. Here in this introspective self-portrait, he's a young man. He was the second son of parents who themselves were both second generation Parisians. In 1845, when he was five years old, his family moved to Le Havre in Normandy, which today is a big industrial port of 172,000 people. His father wanted him to go into the family grocery store business, but Claude Monet had other ideas. He wanted to become an artist. Here he is as an old man, probably in his late 70s. Claude Monet lived until 1926. That's three years after my own mother was born. And he gave the Impressionist movement its name. He was one of its most successful and best known artists. Before Impressionism was fashionable or accepted by the artistic elite, Monet was at the forefront of this revolutionary style. He was one of the founders of French Impressionist painting and the most consistent and prolific practitioner of the movement's philosophy of expressing one's perceptions of nature, especially as it applied to plein air or open air landscape painting. And this was his painting of the Le Havre Harbor, which gave rise to a whole new movement in art and was to give this movement its name, Impressionism. Monet painted this picture in 1872 and it's called Impression Sunrise. Monet was once asked why he chose the title Impression for the work that became the critical flashpoint in the first Impressionist exhibition. He answered that he had painted his own impression of the spectacular blood red sun cutting through the misty atmosphere rather than just a portrait of the Le Havre Harbor. During his life, Claude Monet and his art were often criticized for abandoning the old traditional painting techniques. Monet indeed created something revolutionary in art and formed the base for what would eventually become avant-garde modern art 
And what was so revolutionary in his style? Well, first of all, Monet's Impressionism is mostly about nature. He aimed to capture nature as it appeared to him at the moment. His style is also known for experiments with light and shadow, and light and shadow change during a single day. Monet usually used very strong colors, and he thought about color and shape. Monet didn't focus on scenes and objects. He completely rejected the painting theory of his time and embraced a new style. As he said once, I like to paint as a bird sings. By 1883, he would have been 43 years old. His reputation as a talented painter was already established and his financial situation improved. And he, like other impressionists, began to seek solitude. That year, with a woman called Alice Hoshaday, who became his second wife, along with her six children and his two sons from his first wife who had died, he settled in Giverny, a tiny village located not far from the confluence of the Epta and Seine rivers. Monet lived in places that he had fallen in love with. At Giverny, his passion went mad. The layout of the garden created by the artist which varied depending on the season, was thought out to the smallest detail. Monet lived in this house from 1883 when he first rented it, buying it in 1890 and then living there until his death in 1926. He painted some of his most famous paintings whilst living here, such as the Water Lily series and the Japanese Bridge painting series, both directly inspired by his garden. The artist's former home and elaborate gardens are now officially the Fondation Claude Monet Museum and half a million people a year visit. The house and gardens offered several things he'd been looking for to enhance his paintings. Water, land with potential for development, and light. This living landscape, as he referred to it, gave him varied and ever-changing perspectives for his artworks, but it would be several years and much labor before the house became the artist's home that we know today. Arguably, Claude Monet is one of the greatest artists in history. Even after a hundred years, art lovers are still stunned with the beauty of his paintings, while his style has been consistently praised and copied. No other artist apart from J.M.W. Turner tried as hard as Claude Monet to capture light itself on canvas. It could be said that Monet reinvented the possibilities of color. And just what do you suppose was his inspiration for color? Of course, it was his garden. Monet was a passionate horticulturalist. No. Givernet signaled an important turning point in Monet's life both professionally and personally. He'd experienced constant traveling, financial difficulty, and the death from tuberculosis of his first wife, Camille. The years preceding his arrival at Giverny were turbulent and taxing. He longed for somewhere he could make a home outside of Paris and its hubbub. Once settled, he told his art dealer, I hope to produce masterpieces because I like the countryside very much. This is what his garden looks like in spring. Masses of tulips, daffodils, pansies, and swaths of color. The garden itself is in two parts, with a flower garden in front of the house and the more famous water gardens, which were started 10 years after Monet's arrival at Giverny and the water garden constructed on land bought on the other side of the road from his house. Interestingly, the locals were originally opposed to his plans to build the water gardens, fearful that the strange plants would poison the water of the tributary feeding the ponds. The house, while picturesque, is unremarkable. Its walls are filled with copies of artwork from his contemporaries, as well as some of his own paintings, but they're all copies. So when you visit Giverny, you're not going to see the artwork, but rather that which inspired his artwork. Monet was a huge fan of Paul Cezanne. When the master Giverny eventually became successful and rich, he started collecting eagerly the most beautiful works of his less renowned yet 10-year-old older friend. 
copies of these masterpieces are now exhibited in Monet's bedroom. The originals were either sold by Monet's son or now belong to the collections of the Musée Marmottin Monet in Paris. This is the view out of his bedroom window from the second story, looking down on a profusion of bloom and greenery. As more money became available, Monet landscaped and expanded the house. He built a workshop in the garden in 1911, where he worked on the huge mur murals for the lingerie, lingerie based on the studies of white water lilies. The entire Giverny period stretched almost half a century. This picture could almost be an Impressionist painting, but it is actually a photograph. This, however, is one of his paintings and not a fuzzy photograph. This glorious picture captures the moment when the apple and cherry blossoms are out, as are the tulips. As it happens, tulips are among my most favorite flowers to grow and enjoy, as we will see a little bit later on. Peonies were among Monet's most cherished flowers. Rare species were sent to him from Asia. And needless to say, he was thrilled and took great care of them. Their beautiful colors and fragile looking petals, the giant size of the flowers, their light scent and ornamental foliage make them a perennial favorite. At Giverny, they, they are combined with annuals and spring bulbs. The gardeners experiment with new combinations every year, which is a good tip to avoid monotony in your own garden. If by any chance you're not enthusiastic about the result, it doesn't matter much because bulbs can be changed every year. As it happens, I was there for the peonies and the bearded iris. And this is actually a photo that I took it's hard to appreciate the scale of Giverny and how much planting there is. It is packed with blooms, not a bit of space between the flowers. And it is a feast for the eyes and the nose. It is the most heavenly scents that swirl everywhere. This is another one of my pictures. Bearded iris are one of the great bonuses of a spring and early summer garden, mainly because the sheer impact they make when in full bloom, the ease of their cultivation, and the fact that they come in almost limitless color uh, palette. This includes the color blue, which is a very uncommon hue in flowers, actually. Bearded iris also come in, in purple and black, well, very nearly black. But what exactly are bearded iris and why are they called bearded? Well, there are three parts to a bearded iris. The three petals of the standard, which is the bit that is standing up. Then the fall are the three petals which are hanging down. And then there is the beard, which you can see here on the left is a little yellow caterpillar type thing just on top of the fall. And the blue iris on the right is called dangerous mood. How very French. Beardus, bearded iris come in an infinite number of colors and combinations. The plants need well-drained soil and at least six hours of sunlight per day. A full day of sun is even better to keep the rhizomes dry. France is literally covered in iris. They grow wild along the roadsides and motorways, making it easy to help yourself to a rhizome or two. This is another picture I took the day I visited. And here we can see iris, alliums, and flocks, I believe. While bearded iris do not make great cut flowers, they punctuate a garden with amazing color at a good height, and they have a lovely smell. This picture also demonstrates how packed the beds at Giverny are of wall-to-wall -wall flowers. As his acclaim and wealth grew, so did Monet's gardens. 
six full-time gardeners would eventually help him complete the project. A healthier income meant that he could add more rare and more exotic flowers, irises, peonies, oriental poppies, delphiniums, asters, and various sunflowers, a veritable artwork in itself. Every season at Giverny unfolds new delights. This is the garden in June, and it is a painter's garden. What matters are the subtle and ever-changing combination of colors in the light. In this corner of Giverny, poppies of rich or soft pink are blended with a blue clematis and purple roses. The little blue dots are cornflowers. Late summer is a great time of the year to visit Giverny because of the fantastic dahlias, which are at their best. I like to think of dahlias as the Las Vegas showgirls of the garden. Monet loved dahlias. We know from his stepson, Jean-Pierre Hochaday, that he was fond of a variety called Etoile de Diguin, a starry dahlia that can still be admired in the garden. The current gardeners do their best to find old varieties as far as possible. They also plant lots of modern dahlias because Monet looked for the newest hybrids of his times. Dahlias are said to be easy to cross fertilize. Monet himself is supposed to have made an attempt and obtained a new variety, unfortunately lost to us today. This is the entrance to his famous water garden. The big copper beech on the right was planted by Monet and is now a mature tree, providing wonderful shade in summer. Note the bamboo on the left. From this spot, we cannot quite see the water lily pond yet. It will appear in a few steps. The famous Japanese bridge painted so often by Monet is just in front of us. And here it is the painting of the Japanese bridge called the Bridge Over a Pond of Water Lilies, which was created in 1899, and it's part of the famous water lily series. Inspired by Japanese water gardens, Monet built the bridge over the water in 1899, completing the scene with willows, cherries, ginkgo, and the iconic water lilies. Monet increasingly abandons any human forms in the landscapes he created, a testament to his quest to isolate himself within nature. This was an immersive operative process for him. At, at Giverny, he brought to life his own motifs through meticulously planning, planting, and nurturing his flowers and plants, which he then later translated onto the canvas. Here you see Styria bloom above the bridge and the red beech to the left, uh, which he planted, and the weeping willow over the pond. That electric green, which the bridge is painted, is the same color as the trim on the house, and it seems such a startling color. But as with so much in France, it completely works. Another view and rendering of the Japanese bridge. This particular painting is held by Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. And it's from the art collection of William Church Osborne, class of 1883, who then became a trustee of Princeton University. And this view, which I love, is from the Japanese bridge with the wisteria. And you can see how old the vine is by its size, particularly at the upper right-hand corner. This bridge is one of the most photographed views in the world. And the color green it's been painted is really not the same as any other green in the surrounding area. And here is an autumnal view of the Japanese bridge. Again, simple and mesmerizing. And finally, here's the bridge in winter. The water lilies were the subject for approximately 250 of Monet's paintings, so they received careful and constant care, daily trimmings, 
weeding and cleaning kept them in perfect condition. There are dozens of paintings from this series that represent the trademark of the Impressionist movement. The water lily paintings are probably one of the most praised works in modern and contemporary art. The viewer remains fascinated with the incredible diversity of nature that is represented in these stunning paintings. You can see that he painted the same subjects, but at different times of the year and in different light. Many of the paintings from this series were sold for dozens of millions of dollars at auctions in the last 10 years. This is actually what the lily pond looked like the day I visited. And because it was May, the water lilies were not yet in bloom. But still, look at the richness of the color. While the lilies were still asleep, the koi carp were amazing, very hungry, and very prolific. Monet's success with his garden did not happen overnight, nor alone. He consulted many professionals, fellow painters, and horticultural lovers, as well as gardening journals. While this is a photograph, Note how the reflection in the water looks just like one of his paintings. It was in 1914, at the age of 74, when he had just lost his son and could see no hope for the future, that Monet felt a renewed desire to undertake something on a grand scale as a monument to peace the end of the First World War in 1918 reinforced his desire to offer beauty to wounded souls and ultimately led to his gift to the nation of these enormous panels of water lilies, eight of which are in the L'Orangerie in Paris. The Musée de L'Orangerie is an art gallery of Impressionist and post-Impressionist paintings located in the west corner of the Tuileries Gardens next to the Place de la Concorde in Paris. This photo was taken at the L'Orangerie in front of one of his panels. Late in life, cataracts formed on Monet's eyes, for which he underwent two operations in 1923. The paintings done while the cataracts affected his vision have a, have a generally reddish tone, which is characteristic of the vision of cataract victims. It may also be that after the surgery, he was able to see certain ultraviolet wavelengths of light that are normally excluded by the lens of the eye, and that this may have had an effect on the colors he perceived. After his operations, he even repainted some of these paintings with bluer water lilies than before the operation. Here are two of the eight panels displayed at the L'Orangerie. The top one is called Green Reflections, and the bottom panel is called Morning. In the building, daylight comes from above and floods the space when the, when the sun is out, or when the sun is masked by clouds, the light is more discreet, thus making these paintings resonate according to the weather. The whole set is one of the most vast and monumental creations in painting made in the first half of the 20th century and covers a surface area of 200 square meters. Throughout all the years, struggles and effort, he continually labored on one of his greatest masterpieces, his garden. Thank you, Monsieur Monet, for your passion and dedication and for the inspiration your garden provided to you, which we appreciate through your heroic artistic achievements, which still inspire us today. Voila. And maintenant, we are going to the Loire Valley for more inspiration, this type, a different sort of magnificence. From the Impressionist era, we are stepping back in time to the Renaissance, and our next garden takes us south of Paris, where there are many ancient, historic, and magnificent chateaux in the Loire Valley. However, there is only 
one chateau that has a garden that is truly amazing, and that is Villandry. Completely different from the blousiness of Giverny, it is symmetrical, ordered, snipped, clipped, and perfect in balance, color, and texture. In fact, the only thing that these two gardens have in common, apart from the fact that they are both French, and I happen to have seen them both, is that it is the garden and not the house that people come to see. Voila. This is Villandry, a most remarkable garden and chateau. I visited Villandry in 1986 during the spring, so it must have been April or May. At the time, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and I went on a trip with a girlfriend. Sadly, none of these pictures are mine. And of course, then there was no such thing as an iPhone or even cell phones. Villandry is the last of the great chateau built during the Renaissance on the banks of the Loire River. And it's about a three hour drive from Paris. On the day I visited, I walked around this magic checkerboard completely mesmerized. The gardens cover nine hectares and include six distinct gardens, a water garden with ponds and fountains, an ornamental garden with intricate patterns of clipped box filled with different flowers according to the seasons, and an enormous vegetable garden. Amazingly, the vegetable garden is one of the most beautiful parts of the garden and will have you desperate to overhaul your vegetable plot when you get home. There are 250,000 flowers and vegetables planted annually. Villandry is a complicated and challenging operation, akin to a fashion show with two collections each season. The garden planted once in the spring and rearranged for the summer before giving way to the dormant season. The history of Villandry is long and spans many centuries. In 1532, the Villandry estate and property came into the possession of Monsieur Jean Le Breton, who was finance minister to Francis I. He tore down the old feudal fortress, except for the keep, which is the medieval fortified tower that you can see in the middle of this picture. Monsieur Le Breton wanted to build a lavish chateau and gardens in the Renaissance style. Times had changed, so feudal fortresses made way for delicate chateaux, ramparts became walls which now allowed one to gaze out over the surrounding landscape. The enclosed utilitarian gardens of the Middle Ages made way for ornamental gardens. The descendants of Jean Le Breton remained the owners of Villandry until 1754, when it became the property of the Marquis de Castellain who modernized and embellished it in the neoclassical style, which was in fashion in the 18th century. Napoleon then gave it to his brother, Jerome, in the early 19th century. After changing hands several times and undergoing multiple changes, the Chateau was bought in 1906 by a Hispanic American couple Dr. Joaquim Carvalho and his American wife, Ann Coleman, who was a steel heiress. They fell in love with Villandry and devoted time, energy, and their entire fortune to its restoration. It is thanks to them and their heirs that the residents and gardens are now in their current superb location. Dr. Carvalho dedicated his life to Villandry, giving up a brilliant scientific career. By buying the estate, he saved the castle from being dismantled, and he promised to return Villandry to its former glory. The gardens were restored to match the Renaissance style of the castle, and Carvalho's collection of fine Spanish paintings were installed inside the chateau. I am purposefully not going to dwell on the interior, which I think has now been fully restored, but when I saw it, I remember it as being you know, quite sparse. The state is renowned for its exterior and its six picturesque French formal gardens framed by a series of terraces. They are all built according to a uh, theme and layout. You can clearly see the Renaissance influence here. 
formal, but with a combination of styles, all with balance and precision. The Renaissance garden, influenced by what was happening in Italian gardens, was a new style, which emerged in the late 15th century at villas in Rome and Florence first, inspired by classical ideas, ideals of order and beauty, and intended for the pleasure of the view of the garden and the landscape beyond, for contemplation and for the enjoyment of sights, sounds, and smells of the garden itself. The Renaissance, as we know, was inspired by the classical style of the Romans and the Greeks. To put things in perspective, Pliny the Younger, who died in 113 AD, okay, that, that's over 1,900 years ago, described his life at his villa at Laurentum, which today would be southwest of Rome, as, quote, a good life and a genuine one, which is happy and honorable, more rewarding than any business can be. You should take the first opportunity to leave the din, the future, the futile bustle and useless occupations of the city and devote yourself to literature and leisure. He said, the purpose of a garden, according to Pliny, was to provide seclusion, serenity and relaxation. A garden was a place to think, relax and escape. So you see, after 1,900 years, not much has changed. In the late Renaissance, the gardens became larger, grander, more symmetrical, and were filled with fountains, statues, grottos, water organs, and other features designed to delight their owners and amuse and impress visitors and guests. The style was imitated throughout Europe, influencing the gardens of not only France, but English gardens as well. The romantic English garden was not to Carvalho's taste. So from 1908 until 1918, he devoted himself to recreating the Renaissance gardens. Why? Because he felt the Renaissance chateau, which he had just finished restoring, ought to have fitting gardens. As a man of science, he used a scientific approach to assemble a series of archeological and literary clues by comparing the remains of walls and pipes against old plans and the Napoleonic land register, Carvalho was able to, recreate, to recreate the decorative kitchen garden. Far from being a mere replica of gardens produced in architectural treatises, the gardens of Villandry are a reinvention. From their layout to the choice of vegetables, everything was conceived in terms of a return to the origins of the Renaissance formal garden. He began first, Dr. Cavallo began first with the ornamental vegetable garden. And it was built at the lowest level and near the chateau covering around a hectare. The garden is divided into nine equal squares, separated by large paths covered with sand from the nearby Loire River. You are looking at only one square. Each square is bordered with trellises and each motif is lined with boxwood. The different geometrical shapes were created by planting vegetables and flowers chosen for their color to give the impression of a multicolored checkerboard. Each square contains a fountain, allowing the gardeners to fill up their watering cans to water vegetables that would have been consumed during the Renaissance. Things like cabbages, carrots, turnips, cardoons, leeks, gourds, and pumpkins. Moving the humble vegetable from the edible to the elevated realm of an aesthetic normally reserved for flowers sometimes confuses some of the visitors to Villandry, as some of them are offended that the vegetables are grown to be seen and not eaten, and that they are thrown away like flowers once they wilt. Today, Villandry is still owned by the Carvalho family and is open to the public and is one of the most visited chateaux in France. In 2007, this is the latest information I could find, the chateau received about 330,000 visitors. And it's the ornamental garden, vegetable garden, which is without a doubt the most impressive, especially when seen from above with its nine square plots forming a multicolored checkerboard. 
In the 16th century, Villandry's vegetable garden was already renowned throughout the kingdom, and several centuries later, thanks to Dr. Carvalho, it has rediscovered its former splendor. From the chateau, the Renaissance vegetable garden symmetry creates an incredible optical illusion, making it look like a magical piece of embroidery. And here's an aerial shot that's a great example of that embroidery, but I like to think of it sort of like a needlepoint pillow. Again, very classical lines, very formal, very perfect. This is Laurent Portuguese, head gardener of Villandry, who started there in 2009. And one of his key reforms has been to establish an organic garden. His motto, very apt, is, quote, observe to anticipate and anticipate to avoid using chemical treatments, which has resulted in the transformation of Villandry's gardening practices with his team using traditional weeding techniques, organic fertilization, and natural pesticides to maintain its beauty and integrity. I wonder if he knows Prince Charles. This part of Villandry is called the Love Garden. And on the spring day I visited, I remember my friend huffing and puffing and saying, I'm just going to sit down, you carry on. It didn't quite look like this in 1986, but I was completely under its spell. That day that I visited, there was a profusion of tulips blooming and the squares were framed not by box, which is what it looks like in virtually all of the pictures, but the hedging was extremely short espaliered apple trees, which were in bloom but which were only knee height. Now, I don't know if you can picture a blooming apple tree that is less than two feet tall, but it meant that the side shoots of the miniature trees had been trained and pruned and were each about 20 feet long, forming the hedging around this explosion of tulips. In this picture, and indeed in all the pictures I looked at of Villandry, I could not find those miniature apple trees. This is the first garden I ever remember seeing where tulips were coming up through something else. This photo doesn't really do it justice, but you can see that in the center of the hedging, which appears to be box, are the tulips underplanted with something that is lower <clears throat> in this picture, forget-me-nots, which you can barely make out. But you can also use muscari, known as grape hyacinths, <clears throat> or even anemone. This style of planting made a lasting impression on me, but it wasn't until about 10 years later that I used that inspiration in my own garden. Oh, magically we're transported to Chalfon St. Giles in England. This is pure indulgence on my part, my friends, but it illustrates my point about inspiration. From Villandry to my garden in Chalfont St. Giles, where I planted more than a thousand tulip bulbs every year, these are underplanted with muscari. I would plant the tulips about five inches down and then the smaller bulbs on top or in between. My goal was to achieve a vibrant mass of color. These were all Dutch bulbs, some fringed, some lily shaped, some parrots. And they were all planted in pots which really sprang into life in late May and April. I mean, sorry, late April and May. Later, after they had bloomed, I would replant the tulip bulbs from, uh, it, it, from the pots into my proper garden beds. And the following year, about 30 to 40% would come up again. Tulips became an obsession with me. I had so many every year and I was so thrilled with them. As a result of all this bloom and color, I decided I had to have a party so others could enjoy all this color and not only me. So not to sound like Hyacinth Bouquet, but every May, my husband and I held a tulip lunch party. This was our outdoor patio where you can see clematis blooming in the background, as well as many varieties and colors of tulips. Amazingly for Britain, the weather for this lunch was always fine and bright. Unfortunately, as we all know, tulips do not do well here in the Cape. But while I could, living in Britain, I went absolutely crazy for them. 
And of course, what's a party without flowers? All of which came from my own garden or the hedgerows near our house. But I digress in the spirit of inspiration. Back to Villandry and how it inspired other Renaissance gardens. And thank you for indulging me in this little side trip. Hello. Now, this is actually a diagram of our very own Babylon Storen in Stellenbosch. Oh, it's stalled. Um, I hope most of you are looking at a picture. Oh, now you are. Now you're looking at a picture of Babylon Storen. And as you can see, there's a definite similarity with Villandry. However, my research found that the design of Babylon Storen was actually inspired by companies gardens of the Cape, where for centuries ships would replenish their water, vegetables and fruit at the halfway station between Europe and Asia. Babylon Storen comprises 15 clusters spanning vegetable areas, stone and palm fruits, palm meaning fleshy fruits like apples, pears or quinces. There are also nuts, citrus, berries, bees, herbs, ducks, chickens, prickly pear maize, and more. I'm sure most of you here in Cape Town have visited Babylon Storen, but I could find no direct mention of Babylon Storen, Storen being influenced by Villandry. However, it's something I've always heard. Again, this is Babylon Storen, or will be whenever the slide changes. My husband's telling me there's a bit of a lag. Um, should I go back a slide? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back. Okay, try again. There we go. Okay, so this is Babylon Storm, and it's hard to imagine that this garden is only 13 years old. It's an eight acre garden, formal in structure with a huge variety of fruit, vegetables, and herbs growing in, fret and growing in formal beds, bordered by espalier fruit trees and intersected by walkways. Every one of the more than 300 varieties of plants in the garden is edible or has medicinal value. They are also grown as organically as possible in, and in a biologically sustainable manner. In 2007, the owner of Babylon Storen, Karen Roos, commissioned this chap, Patrice Taravella, a French architect who is actually Italian, and he's about 67 now, years old. She hired Patrice to plan the layout of Babylon Storen. I felt sure I was onto the connection between Villandry and Babylon Storen. However, it was Patricia, Patrice's work at an old priory called Notre Dame d'Orsin in France, which had impressed Karen Roos very much. And there Patrice had reconstructed a medieval cloister garden on the site of a restored 12th century monastery. The priory was in fact, partly the inspiration behind Babylon Storen, as well as Company's Garden and not Villandry. I looked in vain for Mr. Taravella to mention Villandry, but alas, I found nothing. Now in 2017, the garden group of IWC visited Babylon Storen to see its famous clivias. For three weeks every spring, we, like so many other visitors, enjoyed thousands of orange, auburn, and yellow clivia that blanket the banks of Babylon Storm's stream like a river of blooms. And that, oh, I've got one more slide. This needs to change. gardens lie the passion of one or more individuals, whether it is Claude Monet, Pliny the Younger, Monsieur Jean Le Breton, Dr. and Mrs. Caravello, Karen Roos, 
Patrice Taravella, Laurent Portugues. Their influence and inspiration can and will continue for decades, in fact, centuries, and even millennia. Au revoir, mes amis, and may we meet again in a beautiful garden. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Can I unmute everybody now? Sure. Brilliant. That was wonderful. Thank you, Margie. Oh, thanks, Lizzie. It was just gorgeous. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, maybe garden groups should get international some year and take a trip to France. Yes, that would be fantastic. And I hope you can give us a talk at um, Kelvin in the ballroom sometime, one of your well, lovely garden talks. That would be I really would great. Except if I were asked, I have a, I have a subject all lined up. Oh, but I think we have to get uh, through lockdown first. Yes, of course. Yeah. Are we unmuted? Thank you. Thank you very that much. That was just wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Oh, Thank you're you. so welcome, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. Thank have you, Di. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret, have you prepared another one for next month? <laughs> I actually have not. Um, and and uh, my excuse is, <laughs> other than I'm running out of material, um, is that in July, I normally don't do a garden group because I'm normally not here okay. in Cape Town. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I know uh, that. Oh, <laughs> so anyway, I do not have anything prepared. I could, uh, you know, I'll give it some thought because they're fun Please. to do. Yeah. And I, I would like to say thank you to Amanda, who's been so helpful to all yes, of us. Yes, she's great. In getting us together and giving us a, a, a way to communicate and talk. It's, thank you so much, Amanda. Nice. Yes. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, great thank tech you. support. Bye-bye. Nice to see you, Amanda. Lovely to get Bye, together. Yes. Good to see thank you, Marilyn Beyond. Merci bien, merci bien, au revoir. Au revoir, à bientôt. Merci. À bientôt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Thank you.